Hello, and welcome to today's presentation entitled Falling Asleep and Staying Asleep, Understanding Insomnia and the Behavioral Therapies and Medicines Used to Treat It. My name is Gary Zamet. I'm the President and CEO of Clinolab, which is a full-service contract research organization based in New York. I also am an Associate Clinical Professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. We appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to join this presentation. We hope that you find it to be interesting and beneficial. The learning objectives for this presentation are to help you understand the epidemiology of insomnia or how prevalent it is in today's society, to understand how doctors define insomnia diagnostically, uh, what the appropriate treatments for insomnia are, both behavioral treatments and medication treatments, and to help you gain an appreciation for the safety concerns that are related to current hypnotic use or sleep medication use. And uh, then we'll spend a moment giving you information about new clinical trials in the field of insomnia. I'll uh, open with this lovely painting from a painter by the name of Garrett Gow. He lived about 400 years ago. And it's amazing, if you look at this painting, at uh, how current it really is. One could imagine this dog sleeping or resting in one of our own homes today, just as he did almost 400 years ago. Garrett Dow was an expert in the use of um, painting to reflect uh, dim light and candlelight. He was considered to be unparalleled in that. And that's what you see reflected in this painting. In this painting, you see a dog comfortably at rest, perhaps at sleep. And it's a reminder that for some animals, some people and dogs, sleep is effortless, but for others, sleep can be very troubled. Sometimes people have trouble falling asleep and staying asleep. These can be symptoms of insomnia. The most recent criteria for diagnosing insomnia are in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental, Mental Disorders, or the DSM-5. And these are the criteria that doctors use to diagnose insomnia. The first criterion is that the patient has a dissatisfaction with sleep quantity or quality associated with one or more of the following symptoms. Difficulty initiating sleep, that means difficulty falling asleep at the beginning of the night. Difficulty maintaining sleep, that means that the patient has multiple or long awakenings during the middle of the night. Sometimes awakenings that uh, are difficult to deal with because the patient has trouble falling back to sleep. Uh, or early morning awakening with the inability to return to sleep. Sometimes these early morning awakenings occur within an hour or two prior to the desired wake-up time, maybe at 5 a.m. or 4 a.m., and then the person with insomnia struggles, tries, but can't fall back to sleep. In order to be diagnosed with insomnia, the sleep disturbance must cause some clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, educational, academic, or behavioral functioning. So there's some distress or impairment in functioning. Um, most doctors, when they're assessing someone who reports difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep or early morning awakening, most doctors will ask if this results in any kind of distress or impairment. And if the person acknowledges any kind of distress or any kind of impairment, it's sufficient to meet the diagnostic criteria for DSM-5. 
you don't have to be so totally impaired that you can't go to work or can't go to school, can't socialize at all, uh, where your functioning is completely debilitated. Rather, any kind of disturbance, any kind of distress is really sufficient to meet the criteria. The problems uh, with sleep should occur on at least three nights per week, and the problem needs to be present for at least three months in order for the doctor to officially diagnose insomnia. But uh, it is true that people with insomnia work their way up to it. So uh, the person with insomnia for three months has certainly had it for two or one uh, month or one week. Uh, so it, you know, we, we look for the problem being persistent for at least a three-month period, yet we know that even in people who have trouble sleeping for shorter periods, it can be tremendously distressing or tremendously impairing. And the problem occurs despite the adequate opportunity to sleep. In other words, the person who has insomnia sets aside enough time to sleep, but can't sleep within that time. That's very different from someone who might be working uh, the evening shift, then getting up early the next day and reserving only six hours or five hours a night for sleep, and then saying, hey, I, I can't sleep for eight hours. That's different than the person who is allowing themselves an eight-hour sleep opportunity, but unable to fill it with more than four or five hours of sleep. So uh, long and the short of it, though, is that these criteria are the way that doctors define insomnia. You, as someone who suffers from trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, may experience some or all of these symptoms or meet some or all of these criteria. So how common is insomnia? Well, let's take a look at historical data. The left graph shows you occasional insomnia. The right graph shows you chronic insomnia. Occasional insomnia is really an insomnia that may occur uh, a few nights a month, one, two, three nights a month. Chronic insomnia is something that uh, happens uh, more than half the time, so more than 15 nights a month, and goes on month after month after month. If we look at how common occasional insomnia is, you can see that it impacts somewhere between 36% and 56% of the adult population of the United States. It's quite common. So if you have a bad night here or there, it's probably nothing to be too alarmed about. You're in a large group of people who do have those occasional problems. But as the frequency of insomnia increases or the associated impairment or distress, then it does become a matter of clinical concern, something that you should be talking to your doctor about. So occasional insomnia, 36% to 56% of the population, versus chronic insomnia, which looks like it impacts somewhere between 9 and 17 percent of the adult population. Still quite a large number of people, millions of people suffering from chronic insomnia. According to the National Institute of Health, which held a consensus conference in, a few years ago, the percentage of adults in the United States who meet criteria for insomnia is about 10 percent. And if you have to walk away with a takeaway number for how many people in the, in the United States have insomnia, think about, think about that number of 10% uh, of the adult population. Okay. Now, um, how, how uh, does insomnia affect men versus women? How does it affect younger versus older people? Well, this graph shows you that rates of insomnia are quite different in older people versus younger people. If you look at the left of this graph, you see that insomnia is much less common in people who are 
uh, in their teens or early adulthood. And as we get into middle age and old age, insomnia becomes much more common. And then look at the uh, light gray bars versus the dark gray bars, showing you the difference between men and women. You can see that insomnia is much more common in women than it is in men, especially as we get up there in years. So insomnia is a condition that is both age and gender biased. And for most doctors, they know that the typical person coming into their office to report insomnia is going to be a female who is middle-aged or older. Now, another interesting aspect of insomnia is that insomnia is often a persistent condition. In this study that was done by two researchers by the names of Katz and McCorney, what they did is to uh, do a two-year follow-up study of people with insomnia. So uh, what, they, what they did is they assessed people at the very beginning of the study, and they put them into one of three categories. People had either no insomnia, as you can see on the graph, about 800 of them. They had mild insomnia, about 557. And then severe insomnia, 264. And what they did was to uh, wait and follow these people up two years later. And they asked them again about their sleep. So they assessed sleep at the beginning, and then they assessed sleep two years later. And what you see here is the report made by people two years later. So if you entered into the study with no insomnia, two years later, you had about a 75% chance of still having no insomnia. That's pretty good, right? You might have had about a 25% chance, though, of having insomnia, most likely mild insomnia. And just a few percentage points had severe insomnia. If you came into the study with mild insomnia, you only had a little over a 40% chance that two years later you wouldn't have any insomnia at all. Almost 60% of those people continued to have mild insomnia or converted to severe insomnia. And then finally, if you came into the study with severe insomnia, your chances of losing that insomnia were only about 2 in 10. About 80% of those people with severe insomnia continued to have severe insomnia. So what the authors concluded from this particular study is that when insomnia occurs, it tends to persist over the long term. It's a persistent type of problem. It doesn't just go away by itself. And that's particularly true of persistent insomnia. And that's influenced how doctors treat insomnia and how pharmaceutical companies have developed drugs for the treatment of insomnia. There's now a recognition that there are longer term treatments that are needed in order to address the symptoms of this condition. Now, uh, in, uh, in DSM-5, the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, we talk about uh, what's called now insomnia disorder. Um, we don't talk about primary versus secondary insomnia anymore. We used to say, oh, well, the, the insomnia is first and the other symptoms come after. Or uh, someone's depressed and they got insomnia, so the insomnia is secondary. We don't divide it up in that way anymore. Now we just talk about the insomnia disorder. But we do recognize that insomnia often occurs at the same time or coincidentally with other medical problems. And in medical terms, we call this a comorbidity, that two disorders occur at the same time. And we don't make any judgments about which one came first or which one is more important. But we, we know that they are overlapping in time. As you can see from this list, insomnia is commonly comorbid with other conditions, with heart disease, breathing disorders, stomach disorders, 
neurological disorders, uh, rheumatoid disorders or arthritis, uh, endocrine problems, and so on. Um, there are two conditions that uh, I would like to highlight. One is sleep disorders. Insomnia often is co-occurring with other sleep disorders and psychiatric disorders because insomnia often is co-occurring with um, certain psychiatric disorders. One of the psychiatric dis or sorry, one of the sleep disorders that insomnia often co-occurs with is called sleep apnea. Let's take a look at what sleep apnea looks like. Sleep apnea is a sleep-related breathing disorder in which Breathing is impaired or it stops during sleep for several seconds. And this causes the person uh, to uh, have a drop in oxygen levels. And as that period of breathing impairment goes on for 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds, uh, at the end of that time, the uh, sleeper arouses or awakens in order to start breathing again. And then once that person falls back asleep, the breathing problems resume. I'm going to show you what that looks like on a tracing that we obtain uh, in a sleep laboratory setting when we're testing people for sleep apnea. If you look at this tracing, um, it, it looks a little uh, complicated, but I'll try to walk you through it. Um, the, the squiggly lines that you see uh, on this page generally represent uh, brain electrical activity or activity taken from other sensors placed on other parts of the body. And um, the first uh, two lines, oh, well, uh, let me say, this uh, period of recording that you're looking at is about one minute. So from the beginning of the page at the left to the end of the page on the right is about one full minute. Um, and uh, what we see on the tracing at the very top, the first top two channels, where it says LOC and ROC, that's the left eye and right eye. So we're recording eye movement activity. Then the C3, C4, O1, those channels, that's brain electrical activity. The next one is chin muscle activity. The next one is an EKG or heart rate monitor. The next two are the left and right leg muscles. And then the ones highlighted in yellow show you um, air passing through the nose, air passing uh, through the mouth the um, movement of the person's chest, the movement of the person's stomach, and then the bottom line is uh, oxygen blood level. So we watch these tracings uh, over the course of the night to see if somebody has sleep apnea. And this person, in fact, does have sleep apnea. If you look at the very, um, at the very left of the screen where it says nasal flow, and then follow that to the line, you see that that line looks uh, pretty flat. There are a few, few small bumps in that line, but it looks pretty flat. What that means is that there's no air passing through. No air passing through. And you know, and I have to correct something. I just realized it's not one minute. This is actually four minutes of tracing. Um, so no air passing through. And then uh, look at where the lines start to get very high. Well, what's happening there is that somebody is breathing and breathing pretty heavily. So what happened is that that's an apnea where somebody stops breathing. And then uh, at the end of the apnea event, they start breathing and breathing heavily in order to get their oxygen up. And then they fall and they wake up. And then they fall asleep again and the breathing starts to diminish and then ultimately goes flat. It stops altogether. And then they start breathing again very heavily in order to get their oxygen up. 
and then the cycle repeats again and again and again. This is a person who has severe sleep apnea, which means that basically he doesn't sleep and breathe at the same time. Not all cases of sleep apnea are so severe, but the point being that here you can see that a person with sleep apnea can wake up many, many, many times over the course of a night. And sometimes, sometimes they will come in and say, hey, I, I stopped breathing. But sometimes they come in and they say, I can't stay asleep. They, they talk about having insomnia, but they don't have insomnia. They have sleep apnea. And that's why it's important that um, you raise this with your doctor um, so that you can um, tell your doctor your symptoms and your doctor can get you the proper evaluation that you need. There's another type of, oh, here's another case of sleep apnea, which is interesting, not quite as severe. And this one is one minute. Um, but in this case, you see uh, the person has uh, at the nasal flow channel not too much activity. The line goes pretty flat, and then there's a lot of breathing, uh, and then eventually the line goes flat again. Those are apneic events, and those are breathing events. And the person wakes up in order to breathe. There's another kind of sleep disorder. Um, it's called restless legs, where people feel um, pain or discomfort or unusual sensations in their legs. And uh, uh, you know, sometimes these can be very disruptive to sleep, and sometimes uh, this condition is associated with leg movements during the night. If you look here, down at the yellow channels where it says lat and rat, the lat means the left leg muscle, and the rat means the right leg muscle. And you can see those bursts of activity. Well, those are the muscles clenching and tensing up. And each time that happens, the sleeper literally awakens and then has to fall back asleep. So what's happening there is that the, the, the movements are prompting an arousal or awakening. The patient may not come in and say, hey, I am having trouble because I'm moving a lot. The patient may come in and say, hey, I can't stay asleep. So it's really important to think that insomnia is sometimes uh, comorbid with these other conditions, and there are other other conditions that actually could be giving rise to insomnia. Well, um, sleep disorders are uh, are associated with insomnia, probably in about 10 percent of cases. In a much greater percent of cases, are psychiatric disorders. Insomnia is a hallmark symptom of many psychiatric conditions like depression, like anxiety. Insomnia is co-occurring um, in about half of all psychiatric cases. And 70 to 80 percent of people with mood or anxiety disorders, that means depression or anxiety, will report insomnia. And we do know that patients who complain of insomnia but have no current problem with depression are at increased risk of developing depression later on in life, even decades later. Uh, I'll show you some information from a study that was done by a researcher by the name of Naomi Breslau in Detroit, Michigan. And what Naomi did was to um, look at people with insomnia who came into her study and then she waited for three years to follow them up. And she wanted to find out uh, what the rates of depression and anxiety were. Uh, and she compared this to people with no insomnia. So she's comparing the blue bars to the red bar. And what she found was that people who came into the study with insomnia, when they were assessed three years later, had much higher rates of depression than those without insomnia. They had much higher rates of anxiety than those without insomnia. And they even had much higher rates of drug abuse than those without insomnia. So insomnia may actually be a risk factor for 
other conditions like depression, anxiety, and uh, substance use or abuse. Now, uh, to underscore this, I have another study to show you because sometimes uh, people have thought, well, if you have trouble sleeping, of course it's going to, you know, make you depressed. Um, you know, you you have a bad night of sleep for a week or a month, and your mood is going to go down. Well, it doesn't always work that way, and uh, sometimes the fact that you have insomnia can increase your risk much later on in life for these kinds of psychiatric problems. This is a study done by Chang in which he uh, studied Johns Hopkins Medical School graduates, and he looked at um, those graduates right as they were coming out of school. Uh, some of them had insomnia, some of them didn't. So there were 137 who had insomnia, 887 that didn't have insomnia. Okay. So um, what he then did was to follow these patients or these graduates over time, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. And you can see the rates of depression in these two groups. If you look at that top line, that top line of people with insomnia, what you see is that the rate of depression, the percentage of those who had depression, were, was much greater in the insomnia group than in the no insomnia group. And where I put that arrow there, that's about where the two groups became statistically significantly different. So after about 17 years of having insomnia, that's when these people started to show rates of depression higher than those without insomnia, and that trend continued even into 40 years after initially being diagnosed with insomnia. So the insomnia doesn't necessarily have to give rise to depression next week or next month. It could be years later. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why we want to treat insomnia. Now, what causes insomnia? Honestly, we, we don't know. Uh, sleep is a complex process. It's the result of multiple uh, neurotransmitter functions in the brain and also the product of multiple uh, anatomical structures or brain structures uh, that are involved in the sleep and wakefulness process. So we don't have all the answers to why people have insomnia. But we do think one thing, and that is that people with insomnia uh, suffer from what we call hyperarousal. There, there, there's a, a higher level of tension in the system of the person with insomnia. And there's some information to support this notion. Here you see that there are higher levels of the stress hormone cortisol in people with insomnia compared to those people without insomnia. And where do those higher levels of cortisol uh, occur? Well, during the middle of the night, when we should be rested and relaxed. People with insomnia, they have um, high, these higher cortisol levels. Um, but there, that, it's not limited to that. We also know that people with insomnia have higher metabolic rates. So they have higher rates of oxygen consumption, higher brain metabolism higher brain glucose metabolism, higher heart rates, um, higher levels of cortisol, as I just showed you. So uh, all of these factors give rise to the notion that people with insomnia do suffer from some type of hyperarousal. It's also it's interesting when we think about this hyperarousal and insomnia. Uh, people have often said, well, you know, if someone can't sleep at night, uh, they should you know, they need their sleep, so they should try to get some sleep during the day. Well, that's not so easy for someone with insomnia. Most people with insomnia, just like they can't sleep at night, they also can't sleep during the day. They don't have that kind of sleep drive that uh, a normal healthy sleeper does. So while we don't know all of the underlying physiology to insomnia, 
we think that there is some association between physiological arousal and the complaints of insomnia. Now, um, there are lots of reasons to treat insomnia. I think I've mentioned uh, a couple of them to you. One is that it may increase your risk for psychiatric problems. Um, it may do other things as well. We know that you know, people with insomnia have uh, more problems with um, concentration, attention, and memory than those without insomnia. They have more difficulty staying on task than those without insomnia. They report more problems in uh, academic and occupational settings than those without insomnia. They report that their work quality and work quantity is less than people without insomnia. They report higher rates of absenteeism than those without insomnia. They have higher rates of motor vehicle accidents than those without insomnia. And I, I, can, I can go on. So there are, there are lots of problems associated with having insomnia that should drive the sufferer to seek treatment, talk to your doctor, uh, or see a sleep specialist in order to address the problem. Um, you, and, and I think it's important that people need to know that you don't have to white knuckle it. If you have a problem falling asleep or staying asleep, you don't have to just struggle through it. There are treatments available and some very good treatments available that you can take advantage of. Well, the, uh, I've, I've tried to offer you tonight some uh, simple uh, information about treatment. And hopefully this will be helpful to you. So we can, we can put treatment into three categories. Behavioral treatment, non-drug treatment, drug treatment, typically prescription medications, and then finally combination treatments. This would be a combination of behavioral and drug treatment. Let's take a look at behavioral treatment. In, uh, quite commonly when people have insomnia, they begin to develop poor sleep habits uh, because they're struggling with getting the sleep that they need. So they start to do things, and they may unwittingly do things that are not beneficial for them. They may start changing the times that they go to bed or uh, napping during the day and, and so on. And they think it may help, but it, it, it may not. So there are some behavioral treatments that are based on the foundation of what we call good sleep hygiene or good sleep habits. Good sleep habits are things like going to bed at the same time every day, getting up at the same time every day, whether you slept or not, avoiding daytime naps, because if you nap during the day, even a little bit, it can um, interfere with your sleep drive later on at night. You can sleep satiate yourself, just like you can overfeed yourself. You can uh, overfeed yourself on sleep for that day and make it less likely that you'll fall asleep at night. People should avoid stimulants like caffeine and nicotine, particularly before bed. Um, if, uh, if one wants to have a cup of coffee uh, in the morning after you get up, uh, one cup of coffee, half a cup of coffee, might be a terrific way to start the day. But continuing to consume coffee throughout the day and into the evening, that can uh, definitely interfere with sleep. And we often don't recognize that nicotine is a stimulant. Cigarette smoking can interfere with sleep. We should avoid alcohol, uh, particularly before bed. Alcohol does have sedating properties or sleep-inducing properties, but once alcohol blood levels start to fall, sleep can actually be disrupted, and it's more likely for the person to wake up rather than stay asleep. So alcohol is uh, not great if you're having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. It's certainly not a treatment, and um, it can actually make your sleep worse. Um, don't go to bed too hungry or too full and avoid offensive food. If you go to bed too hungry, a hunger pangs can bother you. If you go to bed too full, um, your stomach can be so distended or bloated 
that you feel uncomfortable. That can make it difficult to fall asleep. And some people eat foods that are uh, very oily or very acidic, like orange juice, for example. That can give you what's called reflux, um, where you're uncomfortable and the food, um, uh, the food is trying to wash back up into your esophagus. And particularly with acidic foods, to get uncomfortable. So avoid those kinds of things before going to bed. If you're hungry before going to bed, um, you know, a very light snack, a very light snack uh, might be just the thing to do. Um, exercise in the late afternoon or early evening, particularly um, in intense exercise, exercise that gets your heart rate going, can be helpful uh, for sleepers. If you exercise in the morning, it probably doesn't do anything. If you exercise too late in the evening, it can actually disrupt your sleep. Um, develop a pre-sleep routine. Many people um, will uh, do things like you know, uh, brush their teeth, put their pajamas on, brush their hair, uh, do a little bit of reading, uh, those kinds of things in a regular way every night to help their body anticipate getting into bed and going to sleep. Um, you know, and think about that versus uh, something very different where somebody else might decide that they're going to uh, get on the phone and uh, talk to that relative because they've got to uh, discuss the problems that they've had with that person and get all worked up or got to you know, go to the bank website to pay bills and get stressed about uh, writing checks and paying bills or waiting up for the, the teenage kids to come home and getting stressed out about, about that. So it's really to manage your pre-sleep activity so that you can enjoy a nice pre-sleep routine and have that help you prepare your body for sleep. Uh, avoid watching the clock. Watching the clock can actually be overstimulating. So um, uh, if you're laying there awake in bed and you're looking over at the clock every five minutes, what's that telling you? Well, I'm still not asleep. I, I'm, I'm struggling. Oh, no. I better fall asleep within the next five minutes or it could be worse. Then I'll be awake for another, I'll be awake for 10 minutes. Oh, my gosh. It's overstimulating. So uh, I often recommend that people turn the clock face away from them. You know, sleep is a timeless experience. When you fall asleep, uh, you are not keeping track of time uh, until the moment that you awaken. So forget about time for the, the period that you're supposed to be asleep, and um, and just and just enjoy the evening. I had um, one patient who kept telling me that uh, she would wake up in the middle of the night and she said she said you know I woke up at uh, 305 and then I didn't fall asleep again until 319 and then I woke up again at uh, 411 and then and I was saying well how do you know these times uh, so precisely and she said well I have one of those clocks that display the time on my ceiling so when I'm laying in bed I can just stare up and look at the time so I know exactly when I slept and exactly when I didn't. Well, that was overstimulating for her. Um, don't try too hard to fall asleep. Uh, sometimes that can be counterproductive. By trying too hard to fall asleep, you can actually um, overstimulate yourself, hyperarouse yourself, so that it makes it actually harder to fall asleep. There is one treatment technique that some psychologists will, in fact, use, in which they tell the patient, I don't want you to try to fall asleep. I want you to try to stay awake because uh, uh, then it kind of uh, relieves the patient of that pressure. And then uh, finally, keep track of your sleep environment. You know, make sure that your bed and bedding are comfortable, that your room is dark, that it's not too noisy, that it's at a, a comfortable temperature for you, that the humidity is comfortable for you. Um, all of these things are important. Uh, when we do research on things like the type of bed that you have, whether it's the, you know, the $300 mattress or the $3,000 mattress, uh, there doesn't seem to be much difference in how people sleep. Um, 
when we're looking at uh, commercially available mattresses. But you have to have something that is comfortable to you. You don't want to wake up because uh, you're on the wrong pillow or the wrong bedding. Um, you don't want to wake up because there's too much noise in the room. There are lots of ways to deal with these, these um, problems. Now, uh, behaviorally, there's uh, one treatment technique. There are many treatment techniques, actually, that are effective. But there's one technique that I'll tell you about now, it's, it's, tonight. It's called stimulus control therapy. It was developed by researchers uh, who use this, this model of what's called classical conditioning, in which they believed that the person with insomnia began to associate being in bed with being awake. So that the bed somehow was a stimulus that encouraged the body to stay awake. And so what they wanted to do was to break this association between being awake and being in bed. And they developed a set of rules. So in order to do the therapy, you go to bed at night only when you're sleepy. You allow yourself 15 to 20 minutes to fall asleep, timed in your head. Remember, you don't want to have the clock staring at you. And then if you're unable to fall asleep within that first 15 or 20 minutes, you get out of bed, you go into another room, and you engage in some sedentary activity, something that's not too stimulating. Um, people might have a book or a magazine that they'd like to read, or there might be uh, um, an entertaining, not overly stimulating television show. Um, I had one patient who liked to crochet. Um, you know, something that is uh, enjoyable but not too stimulating, and you do that activity until you feel sleepy. And then you return back to bed and repeat. Give yourself another 15 or 20 minutes. If you're asleep, that's terrific. If not, you get up out of bed, engage in some sedentary activity until you're sleepy again, and go back. There are a couple of rules to this, which is that, that um, you'd use your bed only for sleep, You'd get up at, out of bed at the same time each morning, regardless of what happened the night before. So if you set your wake-up time at 6 a.m., even if you were up and down you know, many times over the course of the night, you'd still get out of bed at 6 a.m. And then you do have to uh, avoid daytime naps and exercise caution during the day if you are sleeping. And the graph on the right, what you can see is the number of times that people get out of bed over the course of their therapy. The days of therapy, is uh, that represents about a two-week period there, or sorry, a four-week period there. And uh, on the horizontal axis and then on the vertical axis, it's the number of times getting up out of bed. At the very beginning of treatment, what you see in the first two weeks is that people have some very bad nights and some better nights. So, some nights they're getting up out of bed as much as seven or eight times, um, just repeating and repeating the cycle. And then the next night they might have a better night, but then next night they're getting up, uh, you know, again, you know, four or five times or, or whatever. Um, what happens, though, is that after about two weeks, what you see is that people are getting up out of bed much less. And the reason for that is that they're sleeping better. So um, this treatment, all by itself, uh, especially when you combine it with good sleep hygiene, can really uh, have a beneficial impact on sleep. And if you stick with it um, after a couple of weeks, you'll begin to see the beneficial effects of this type of behavioral therapy. There are no guarantees, uh, but um, the uh, research data indicate that this works for a lot of people. But behavioral therapy is not the only thing that's available. In addition to behavioral therapy, there are drug treatments. Now, there are a lot of uh, drug treatments available for insomnia. Some things you can buy over the counter, uh, which might be effective for a night or two. But if you're having more uh, ongoing problems with insomnia, 
then we're talking about the use of prescription medicine. There are many prescription medicines that are both safe and effective. They, um, they uh, are beneficial for people who have insomnia and they can be used safely. And this illustration just shows you that uh, when we look across uh, a wide swath of studies of sleep aids, that they are effective in helping people fall asleep, so it reduces sleep latency. They're effective on sleep duration, so they increase sleep time, effective on reducing the number of awakenings, and effective in improving sleep quality. So across the board, um, the prescription sleep medicines uh, show effectiveness. And the most common sleep medication is uh, right now generic Zolpidem, uh, which, which is sold under the trade name of Ambien. So if you have insomnia, I'm sure you've heard of Ambien. Um, that, that is uh, Zolpidem, that's the generic name. So Zolpidem accounts now for about 30 million prescriptions for sleep aids. It was approved as a generic in 2007. The average cost for a prescription uh, per month is about $12 in the United States. Um, and there's a, there's a sustained release formulation called Zolpidem ER. And that cost is uh, higher than the immediate release formulation, but, um, uh, but still quite affordable as a generic. The original formulation helps you fall asleep. The extended release formulation is intended to help you fall asleep as well as stay asleep. Um, the reason I put up the, the Zolpidem data is because the number of prescriptions for Zolpidem outnumber the prescriptions for all other sleep drugs combined. So it's the most commonly uh, prescribed prescription sleep drug. Um, there are adverse effects that can be associated with Zolpidem as with other prescription sleep drugs. Um, one is a problem known as residual sedation. That means uh, sleepiness after you get up out of bed in the morning. So if you've taken too much medicine or you've taken the medicine too late, um, uh, you can be sleepy and groggy in the morning. That can not only be uncomfortable, but can also represent a risk if, for example, you have to get up and drive somewhere. So that's uh, a safety concern. Um, with uh, sleep drugs, there have also been things described like um, that are called complex behaviors. Um, these are things like sleep driving, sleep eating, sleep sex um, that, that happen after somebody uses a sleep medication. Um, in clinical practice, we don't see too much of this um, unless the person has taken the medication at the wrong time or has, they've taken it with other medications or alcohol or they've taken a dose that was much higher than the recommended dose. Um, when the medication is used according to prescription, uh, the likelihood of these complex behaviors occurring is very, very low. Um, and recently, the recommended dose for uh, Zolpidem has been reduced from 10 milligrams to 5 milligrams because there was some information that uh, women may actually have higher blood levels than men and remember that women are much more likely to have insomnia than men. So females were much more likely to get uh, prescribed the medicine. Um, so the FDA made an adjustment in the dosage recommendation. Um, now, one of the things that I mentioned to you earlier was that, um, that insomnia is persistent. In the studies that I showed you, insomnia goes on for years sometimes. And, um, in cases like that, uh, we, I'm going to skip over this slide. This is the ER slide. But in cases like that, we needed a treatment that could be used over the long term. Um, this is Azopiclone. It's sold under the trade name of, of um, uh, Lunesta. And here you can see six months worth of data comparing uh, people with uh, as zopicone treatment on the bottom blue line versus uh, placebo or sugar pill treatment on the top red line. And you can see 
that the amount of time that these people spend awake during the middle of the night is much lower on azopiclone versus placebo. And those effects persist for six months. Um, it was showing this type of data that helped the FDA and uh, practitioners make the determination that sleep medicine should be prescribed for insomnia and the term of use of the medicine shouldn't be limited to a short period. So right now, um, virtually every sleep medicine that gets approved is approved for the treatment of insomnia, not for the treatment of short-term insomnia, but just for the treatment of insomnia, recognizing that the condition um, can be longer term and deserves a longer term treatment. And taking a longer term treatment doesn't mean that the person using the treatment is uh, dependent or addicted. It just means that they have a treatment that's effective for them over the long term. Uh, now, there are other uh, medicines other than Zolpidem and, and similar drugs. Uh, that uh, have been developed for treating insomnia. Uh, Low-dose doxepin has been developed. It's, uh, it acts as a histamine receptor. It's an antihistamine. And it improves sleep maintenance, so it helps the person stay asleep longer. Um, that's uh, sold under the trade name of Silenor. And then more recently, uh, people have been developing what we call orexin receptor antagonists. Or the erection receptor is, um, is really one receptor that modulates wakefulness and sleep. Orexin is a wake-promoting uh, neurotransmitter. And so if we prevent that neurotransmitter from doing it, uh, what it, it normally does, um, we can produce a sleep effect. And most recently, uh, there have been studies on orexin receptor antagonists called suvorexant. The uh, trade name for that is Belsamra, and that was found to reduce the amount of time that it takes people to fall asleep, and also increase the amount of wakefulness after people, or uh, sorry, in, uh, increase the amount of sleep, reduce the amount of wakefulness after people first fall asleep. That drug, um, just coincidentally, was approved by the FDA yesterday uh, for the uh, doses of 5, 10, 15, and 20 milligrams. Now, um, what, do we, uh, what do we see as combination therapies? I'll just spend a brief moment talking about that. Um, very often, sleep aids can be used in combination with behavioral treatments. In one study, the study that I'm going to show you now, um, uh, there were uh, 500 and 50 primary care doctors or clinics in Germany that were involved in the study. They tested almost 2,700 patients. The patients had an average duration of insomnia of just over five years. The patients were given Zolpidem uh, all by itself to use whenever they felt they needed it. They could use up to a maximum of five tablets per week for three weeks. Then after three weeks of treatment, the subjects used um, the Zolpidem uh, plus stimulus control therapy on nights that they didn't have drugs. And what the um, authors of the study found was that on the original three weeks, the subjects were using uh, just under four tablets per week. So they they didn't maximize out the number of tablets that they, that they used. And in fact, they could have used five, but they weren't using five. They were using under four, which means that they weren't having insomnia uh, every night. They, they weren't even having it five nights. And then after three weeks of standard treatment, when the stimulus control was added, um, they were using less than three pills per week. So uh, the combination treatment can be quite beneficial, not only in terms of how effective it is for the person who suffers from insomnia, but on how often they would have to take a sleep aid to help them fall asleep. Now I said I'd uh, talk about upcoming clinical trials. I think what we can expect to see in the coming months and years uh, is that pharmaceutical companies will continue to explore 
new mechanisms of action, such as the mechanism that was just approved yesterday by the FDA, uh, a drug that acts at the orexin receptor. Um, the challenge for pharmaceutical companies is that they have to find medicines that are as effective as Zolpidem or Ambien or better, and they have to have a good safety profile. That means that we don't want to see any next day sedation, we don't want to see any unusual behaviors, and we don't want to see any other adverse effects associated with these newer medicines. So there's a hurdle to get over and a challenge, but uh, pharmaceutical companies are definitely interested in helping people who suffer from insomnia, and they're interested in developing new medications to do that. Um, if you would like more information about um, sleep disorders in general, you can go to the National Sleep Foundation website, which I've highlighted here, or you can go to the Sleep Disorders Institute website, uh, which gives you not only information about sleep disorders, but allows you to link to um, sleep centers throughout the nation uh, through a search engine. If you want more information about um, participating in a clinical trial, uh, you can go to CISCRIP, uh, that is uh, CISCRP.org, and get information about trial participation. If you want information about clinical trials nationwide, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. If you're looking for information about trials that we are planning at ClinLab in our New York or New Jersey facilities, you can contact us by phone, you can visit our website, email us, text us, or walk in, and we'll be happy to serve you. And we are, uh, that concludes the presentation component of the, of the evening, and I'm able to take uh, questions. We still have a little time for questions. Uh, if you enter your question into uh, the message area, into the chat area, we'll get them and we'll be able to respond. Ah, okay, here comes, here comes the first uh, question. Uh, I have difficulty falling asleep but not difficulty staying asleep. Does that make a difference in the type of treatment I should be looking for? Um, okay, so that, in fact, that may be the case. There are some medications that work at the very beginning of the night, but they don't have much of an impact on later in the night. Um, medications like Zolpidem or Ambien, there's also another medicine, Remelteon, it's sold as Rosarum. Um, those work at the beginning of the night, for example. And then other medicines uh, have an effect later on in the night. Uh, they may impact the beginning, but they have later on effects, such as uh, Zolpidem ER, that's sold under the trade name of Ambien CR, or S. Zolpiclone, sold under the trade name of Lunesta. Uh, those have an impact on sleep maintenance. So the type of insomnia that you have could influence the type of treatment that you'll get. But what's most important is that you present your symptoms clearly to your doctor so that your doctor can determine what type of diagnostic workup needs to be done, if any, and then what type of medication would be prescribed. Um, and uh, here's another question. Uh, could insomnia cause long-term migraines? Well, um, in, in, if you're suffering from insomnia and migraine headaches, it may be that insomnia is not, uh, quote unquote, the cause of migraines, but having insomnia can increase the likelihood that a migraine headache will come on. And you know, and if you're a migraine sufferer, um, you, you know that migraines can be kicked off from a variety of, of different uh, things. It could be stress, it could be insomnia, it could be a type of food that, that you've eaten. There's so many different things that, that can kick off the migraine, but um, insomnia may not be the cause, but may increase the risk of you developing a migraine headache. Um, 
And uh, in general, one of the uh, things I, I'll comment on is the, the association between um, insomnia and pain. And in, in general, we know that if we just take a, a normal healthy sleeper and wake that person up a whole bunch of times and expose that person to a pain stimulus, they're much more sensitive to the pain stimulus uh, than they are if they're a healthy sleeper uh, or, and, and undisturbed sleep and then exposed to the pain stimulus. So the, having the uh, frequent awakenings or long awakenings seems to make us more sensitive to pain and that may actually uh, make the migraine experience uh, work for you. Uh, for sleep apnea, you have devices like CPAP machines to help. Is there anything for insomnia that is similar? Um, uh, you know, uh, to my knowledge, we really don't have a medical device that is uh, commercially available or commonly used for the treatment of insomnia. Um, there have been some devices that have been tested, but the testing has not proved fruitful. So um, I really don't think that there are these devices out there um, on, on the market. Um, the most common uh, treatments for insomnia are, as I said, behavioral treatments um, or drug treatments or combinations thereof. And I, I will say, in my experience, after treating people with insomnia for many, many years, um, if a, a person is determined and committed to following through with behavioral therapy, and if the person is willing to use their medication according to prescription, um, the chances of improving insomnia are very good. You know, we, that, we as sleep specialists, we can't take a bad sleeper and turn them into a world-class sleeper in most cases. But um, if you used to be a good sleeper and then developed insomnia, um, we've got a pretty good chance of being able to get you from where you are now to back where you were before you had the insomnia. Uh, but unfortunately, those devices don't seem to exist. Um, uh, we know, here's another question, we know that depression or stress can cause insomnia. Can chronic or untreated insomnia lead to other conditions like dementia and depression itself? Well, uh, you know, that, that's one of the things that I was um, uh, trying to show in the data is that if someone has insomnia, and especially if that insomnia goes untreated, that the risk for developing depression is much, much greater than if you don't have insomnia or if the insomnia is treated. So uh, insomnia does appear to be a risk factor for, uh, for depression. With regard to dementia or developing cognitive impairments like, um, like Alzheimer's disease, um, I don't think we have a, a very clear picture that insomnia itself um, causes the cognitive impairment, causes the Alzheimer's disease. But we, we do know that one of the features of Alzheimer's disease, particularly as it's progressing, is, um, is sleep disturbance. And, um, and in fact, in some people, they do something called sundowning, where instead of getting relaxed and, and rested and comfortable at night, they begin to get agitated at night and diffi difficult to control. So, um, and, and there is some good data to show that uh, as people with Alzheimer's disease begin to develop these problems with insomnia, uh, that is the point at which the family system breaks down um, and they can no longer really care for the person at home. And that's when the person goes into uh, you know, residential care facility to deal with those problems because um, the, the family at the end of the day or in the middle of the night, they can't, they really can't take care of their elderly relatives. Um, okay, so I, I don't see um, any more questions coming in at the moment, and I recognize that I've, I've just gone on for quite a long time. So uh, I will thank everyone for your participation this evening.
If you have any questions, don't hesitate to send them in to us. We'd love to hear from you. And we appreciate your attendance. Um, thank you very much. And good night.